All right, now we've talked about how we know viruses are unique agents. We've talked a little bit about the relationship between viruses and disease. Now we want to talk about what viruses are made of because that's in some cases what we're testing for are viral molecules and the vaccines that we make are viral molecules. So the answer is that viruses are made of exactly the same types of macromolecules as the cell is, but of course a lot simpler and a whole lot smaller. Uh, one analogy that I heard a while ago that I always liked is that if the cell is a circus tent, then the virus is the size of an orange. It's so tiny, it's so insignificant. It makes you understand how a virus could get into a cell and just be, first of all, be ignored for a while and get a chance to replicate and do its own thing and the cell doesn't notice it. Or it gets in and it just never gets where it needs to go within the cell and you have an abortive infection. So I'd like to review the macromolecules of the cell. This is not a biochemistry course, but we just sort of need to get familiar with these different kinds of molecules in a general sense. The first is protein. Proteins make up both the outer structure of the virus as well as being all the enzymes that are needed to replicate the genes. Up here, I show a poliovirus, and you can see that the geometry of all these proteins, there are, there are actually four types of proteins, but only three are on the outside. These three types of proteins are color-coded. The geometry of how they fit together is really beautiful. Uh, it, and it fits perfectly. It's a perfect little package to hold the genes inside. At the bottom, I've got a coronavirus enzyme just shown two different ways to show you, show you that there's many different ways that proteins get depicted. What we call the model on the left-hand side is the space-filling model and this is referred to as a ribbon molecule, which shows you in a little more detail how the chains of amino acids are folded together because proteins always are one long chain of smaller units called amino acids that fold up in a very particular way. And based on how it folds, that determines the shape that a protein has. Next, we have nucleic acid. A nucleic acid is the name for the molecules that there's really just two types, DNA or RNA. DNA is pretty much the same all the time. It always takes the same shape. This is double-stranded DNA. And I'm sure you've seen images of this double helix or this twisted corkscrew shape that DNA tends to take. Uh, RNA, some viruses have genes made of RNA, which is very different from our genes. Our genes are made of DNA, of course. RNA takes lots of different shapes, as you can see here. This is an incredibly elaborate folded structure, and this is a bit smaller, a little bit simpler shape, but you can see how it folds back on itself. And this RNA, the long um, skinny bit, the long string is meant to be RNA. And down below, this is a big protein structure that's depicted on the RNA, sliding down the RNA. It's actually translating, if you know that term, making protein uh, from uh, based on the information that's in the RNA. And so the genes of the virus are either DNA or RNA. And each particular virus has a very particular type of genome. Here we see all the different types of virus genomes. So DS stands for double-stranded DNA. So these, this type of genome is very similar to the way our genes work. Other viruses have a single-stranded DNA genome, which gets 
converted into double-stranded DNA once it gets infected. And then there are some with double-stranded RNA or single-stranded RNA that we call plus sense. And that's because it's the same as messenger RNA. It can be translated. It's not really necessary. You know all the molecular biology part of this. Some of the terms might be familiar to you from an earlier biology class, maybe high school, I don't know. Uh, but plus-stranded RNA, negative-strand RNA, they're just sort of opposite senses, and they can be converted from one to the other. Um, and then some viruses, like the retroviruses, of which HIV is one, get they sort of go backwards from RNA back to DNA. That's the opposite of what happens in all living cells. All living things have a double-stranded DNA genome. Genes within the genome, some of the genes are transcribed, or you make an RNA copy of a single gene, and the information in that RNA copy is used to make protein. There you go. There's all of molecular biology. Uh, and, but in some viruses, we go backwards. We reverse transcribe, and you make DNA from an RNA template. And so you'll often hear viruses described, or a virologist will talk about, oh, that virus is, that virus is a plus-stranded RNA virus, or that virus is a single-stranded DNA virus. They just mean the type of genome it has, because there are some certain similarities you tend to see among viruses of a given type. Now, having said that, there's still a whole lot of variation within each group. Our third molecule type are lipids or fats. Viruses that have a lipid layer around the outside are called enveloped viruses. And coronavirus is an enveloped virus. And down here, you can see how coronaviruses get their lipid coating. They do that by sort of pushing into the, an internal vesicle inside the cell. And so it's pushed in here, and then this gray bit gets wrapped around the outside. And then the whole thing moves to the surface of the cell, and it's released that way. Um, there are other ways to pick up a membrane. Some viruses will bud right from the surface directly instead of going through this middleman here. Uh, but viruses, so viruses that have this lipid bilayer, this lipid coating, are called envelope viruses. The polio virus that I showed you earlier is a non-enveloped virus. The there is no fat at all in that particular virus. It's just the protein coat. An enveloped virus has a protein coat or a capsid on the outside, but the outside of that is the lipid bilayer. Fourth kind of molecule found in viruses and the fourth kind of molecule found in cells are sugars. I just really include this for completeness. Sugars don't play a big role, and they're only present on enveloped viruses. Where you do find sugars when they're there is in the proteins that are around the outside of the virus that are stuck in the envelope or the lipid bilayer. And you see the word glycoprotein, glycoprotein. You got four kinds of glycoprotein. We're not going to worry about the names of the four different glycoproteins. Uh, and so what a glycoprotein is, is a protein that has a couple little bits of sugar added on at the end. So it's relatively small relative to the protein as a whole. And generally speaking, <clears throat> it's not even shown. I mean, this sort of lollipop structure just implies it's a protein. This is a really, really simple way to show a protein. Uh, and it does come into play sometimes when designing vaccines or in discussing why antibody responses are effective or not effective against a particular kind of virus, but it's not the most important of all the molecules. And 
just to finish up, this is our first nice picture that I've put up here of coronavirus. So we see proteins in the envelope. So here in the envelope, all the, the green and the yellow and the purple, these are depict different proteins. We've also got the red molecule is also a protein. This is a protein that's bound to the RNA. The RNA is in yellow. So the genome is plus stranded RNA. There's just one really long piece inside the virus. Uh, we've got the capsid protein. So the capsid is not, so the protein that makes up the structure is sort of the tail of this membrane glycoprotein. So it's not really shown beautifully, but these little tails really connect a little bit better than it's shown here to make a tight structure. And then inside that is the RNA. Another way that we know what viruses are made of or what viruses are like is to look at them under the electron microscope. And the images that we see show us a very regular repeating pattern. So again, we, we already know from other evidence that they're very simple structures, but we see that here. So in the middle, you see rabies virus and papilloma virus on the right. Uh, very simple, and you can see the evidence of repeating structures. I did include on the left the image of Marburg virus, just to show you that while there is simplicity here, you can see the regular repeating structure, this is kind of a stripy pattern, uh, but that some viruses are, we say, pleomorphic. That is, they will produce a variety of structures. And we'll come back to that a little later. So viruses are made of protein, nucleic acid, and sometimes lipid envelopes. So how do we know that each virus type is unique? How do we know that cold viruses are different from influenza viruses, as for example? Well, first of all, we can look at them under the electron microscope. Now, these, of course, are not directly electron micrograph images, but they're taken from electron micrograph images, these particular drawings. And we can see that different viruses just look different, so they're not the same. Influenza virus looks nothing like the common cold virus. They have unique structures, unique patterns. Next, we can see that viruses have unique host range. Now the term host range refers both to the species that a virus can infect and the cell type it infects. So it just depends on the context. For example, we say that the host species for hepatitis B virus is humans. It only infects humans. In addition, if we're talking about the cell that the hepatitis B infects, its host range is only liver cells. So it has a very narrow host range, both with respect to species and cell type. On the other end of the species, I'm um, sorry, the other end of the spectrum is rabies, which can pretty much infect any mammal. So it has a wide species range. However, the cell type it infects is still pretty limited, primarily <clears throat> neurons and salivary glands. The term permissiveness is related to this concept of host range. Permissiveness is the property of a cell that refers to the ability of that cell to support infection by a particular virus. So for example, mouse cells are not generally permissive to poliovirus, but if you add a particular human cell surface protein, or that is you add a gene for that protein into mouse cells, it will make the mouse cells permissive to poliovirus. As a general piece of information, I want to point out that RNA viruses tend to have a much wider host range than viruses with a DNA genome. And we really see that with arboviruses. Arboviruses are arthropod-borne viruses. That is, they're viruses that infect both insects and, or arthropods, and uh, vertebrates, vertebrates, mammals and birds. And so 
in this case, the species range is so wide, it's not just different classes of the same uh, phylum, it's different phylum altogether. And to clarify, just because this is the first time I've brought up arboviruses, not all RNA viruses are arboviruses, but all arboviruses have an RNA genome. Finally, we know that viruses are not just one thing, but a whole lot of separate, non-overlapping things, because immunity that you get to one virus infection is specific for that virus. We saw this really clearly in the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. H1N1 virus, influenza virus, had circulated many years ago, and older individuals who had been infected with that virus in the past showed much reduced susceptibility because they still had immunity left over from that infection, even when they were older. Of course, we exploit that principle of our immune system when we vaccinate. You give a bit of a virus or a weakened virus or part of a virus as basically target practice for your immune system. And that immune response will protect you from the actual virus if you encounter it later on. All right, so this concludes the introductory unit on viruses.